I know it's raining. I know you're sleepy. I know you're tired. Maybe you had a long week. But when I say good morning, I want enthusiasm. Because you're happy to see this beautiful face, right? <laughs> Actually, you're happy to come and worship God. So let's act like it. Good morning! Good morning! That's the spirit right there. That is it. Be like that. Be like that. That's exactly how you need to be. Good morning and welcome back to another Sunday service here at Glencoe United Methodist Church. I am glad that you are here, that you braved this flood that we're having. I made the joke earlier that someone, if they need an ark, I know a guy. And if you've never heard that before, I'm sorry for doing it now. Um, but I am glad that you are here to worship with us this day, and I am glad that you can be in the house of the Lord so that way we can worship him steadfast. Now, it is important that before we get started with our announcements and such, I have a critical announcement that you might want to know before you come in next week. We are not going to be in here anymore as of next week. We are going to try out the sanctuary again. And so you will see as you're leaving that it's marked where certain pews are marked off. We're not sitting in those pews, okay? If you can't get into that pew, of course, if you're above this tall, then you cannot sit there. And the, way, the reason we're doing that is we're trying to socially distance people in our pews. So just try to keep that in mind and try to stagger as best as you can throughout the sanctuary. So that way we don't have to worry about people breathing on the back of your neck and everything during this time. Any questions about all that? Clear as mud? Good. All right, so our announcements for the day. First off, don't forget we have Trunk or Treat coming up this Saturday. It's going to be from 4 to 6, and it's going to be a lot of fun, as always. If you've got a trunk in mind, come on down. And if, if you're going to hand out candy, please either hand out the candy yourself or put them in like little treat bags or candy bags so that way kids don't have to go grab them all at the same time. We don't want to spread germs if we don't have to. Um, so just be creative and smart about that. Uh, we are going to be having food. We're going to have hot dogs, chips, and drinks if you want that, but it'll be to go. So we're going to cook them ahead of time. We're going to wrap them, and then you can purchase them. And then, of course, uh, we'll have condiments for you and everything like that. And you can choose your chips and drink. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? I know we hadn't had hot dogs in a while, so I figured it'd be a, a nice relief to have some hot dogs again, right? I know I've missed hot dogs. I, I'll, I would be, I'll be one of the first to admit I haven't really eaten a hot dog since we quit doing uh, Wednesday night meals last night. And I'm kind of sad. <laughs> I need hot dogs in my life. I'm sorry. Uh, but speaking of food, we're going to have the Brunswick stew. Um, thanks. We're going to have the Brunswick stew on the 21st. So that means for all you cooks, not Judy, all you cooks who are going to be cooking, what day are you going to be here? Huh? Yeah. Okay. At least we know some of y'all know. Okay. For those of y'all that don't know, talk to the ones that do know. And then we're going to be picking up the, the stew quartz on the 21st, and we're going to do that between the hours of 9 and 12. And so that's we chose that time because it gives people plenty of time to get here. If you have not signed up for buying stew, there's a sign-up sheet at the table when you came in where you had to sign the little waiver. There's a, there's a sign-up sheet right there. Make sure to put your name down on that so that way you can... Um, Get as much stew as you want. And as you may also know, we have the bazaar that day. And I want to make sure that we have plenty of time for people to be able to look at the stuff at the bazaar if they so choose. Um, so we're going to have a bake sale there and we're going to have other artistic uh, crafts and maybe even some artwork and stuff. So if you want to do that and support the UMW, please do. We're going to have that going on. If you're interested in submitting something to sell, just talk to Beth. You know, either email her or call her. She'll be glad to help you out with the details on that. And speaking of uh, fundraising, we also have That's My Pen that's going on for the UMW. If you've not yet purchased anything for That's My Pen, now's the time to do it. It's, a, it's an awesome thing because we get a good chunk of the profits. They're actually really good for that. And they're really cool. I don't know about you, but if I had something that has my name on it, that's personal to me. Nobody else's name or anything is going to look just like that because 
How many Matthew and Lindsay with an A Johnsons are in this world? Not very many. So it's going to be nice to have my own personalized pen so that way I can say, that's mine, not yours. Because let's face it, how many times have you went to a family reunion or some sort of gathering or potluck where somebody wanted to take your dish or they did take your dish? It's happened more than once in my family. So this is a way of preventing that. We have an Advent Bible study coming up. And it's going to start at the uh, end of November on the 25th. It's Wednesday nights from 6.30 to 8. And this Advent study is based on a book called Incarnation by Adam Hamilton. For those of y'all who have taken Bible studies with me before, you know I like this Adam Hamilton. This is his newest one. It literally came out during the pandemic, and I bought it. I basically pre-ordered it and got it the day it came out. So um, it's, a good, it's a good Bible study, and we're going to really enjoy that. It's talking about the royal titles of Jesus and why we need to be reminded of what Advent is really about. And so it's going to be a really good study. Um, and then, of course, there's Amazon Smile. Christmas is coming up. You know this. It, it, it comes up every year. If you forget about it, it's here already. And then you got to buy presents. Because let's face it, a lot of people love presents that are around that time of year. If you buy through Amazon, please consider signing up for Amazon Smile and putting us as your charity and it will donate 0.5% of each of your purchases to the church. And we collect it like every quarter or something like that. But if you think about it, if you think about how much you're going to purchase on Amazon, let's say if you do purchase from Amazon, and you're going to buy a lot of gifts for a lot of family members, think about how much money you're giving back to the church at no cost to you, just a little, a few minutes of your time to set it up and make sure you go to smile.amazon.com. It's the same website as Amazon, it's just got a different URL, which is how they are able to differentiate the 0.5% versus a regular purchase on a regular Amazon. Questions about that? If you have any questions, talk to me or Lindsay. We know how to set that up pretty easily. I've already helped my dad set it up and my grandfather too. And let's go ahead and get started with worship this day. Will you pray with me? Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this opportunity to come in here into the dry and worship your holy name. We thank you for this space that is here for us as a safe place, as a place, as a sanctuary for us to come, hear your voice, hear you speak to us, hear you in the lives around us, and to feel you in your presence. Lord, as we sit here this day, be with us, give us your strength, and give us your wisdom. Allow the words that I say, say today and the feelings that we feel, the words that we hear, be powerful to us. May they transform us through your loving grace and allow us to be more faithful and loving disciples. For the glory of your kingdom. Amen. <laughs>
Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this day and for these people. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in this space as uh, your loving and humble children. And we are thankful to call you our God, our sustainer, our comforter, our redeemer. Oh Lord, you give us comfort during our times of struggle and turmoil. And you give us uh, excitement and joy during the times that are going well in our lives. These are blessings and we are thankful each and every day for those blessings that you have given us. Lord, be with those who we have mentioned today, and be with those who are in, in our hearts and in our minds and our thoughts, but didn't get mentioned today. Even the ones that we forgot to mention today, please keep them in our hearts and minds. Allow them to be flooded with your love and your peace during their times of difficulty, whether it's through illness, through difficulty getting out of the house, or whatever else it may be. And Lord, we are thankful for the many blessings that you give this church, not just each and every one of us, but the blessings that this church has because of you. Because without you, O oh Lord, nothing is possible. Lord, as we continue with worship today, may we continue to keep these persons uh, that we love and care about on our minds, allow them to be written into our hearts so that way we can always have our thoughts and prayers and love be about them and about you. We ask all these things through your Son, who is the Christ, Jesus. Amen. Let us go to God in prayer as we bless our offering this day. Gracious God, before you are our gifts of offering and tithes. Lord, before you is our, is our opportunity to do your work in this world. Help us multiply this so that way your work can be done, so that way your transformation of this world from one of sin to one of grace can be done. Lord, we give these to you because we know that nothing that we have is ours, but it is yours. Please take this back, O oh Lord, and use it for your good, for your kingdom, so that way you and your will can be done. We ask all these things through your son Jesus. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. And this is the uh, letter that Paul wrote to Thessalonica after he had left and realized that he could not come back because of things that came up and things that prevented him from coming. Hear now the word of God. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with the pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others. Though we might have made demand, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ, we, but we were gentle among you. Like a nurse tenderly caring for her own children, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, before we get started, I want to make sure and give you the heads up that today we're just going to come right out of the gate running. I'm not going to beat around the bush. I'm not going to soften my words. I'm not going to flatter you. I'm going to be open and honest. And hopeful that you will hear these words as ones of exhortation or encouragement. Ready? Here we go. Are we all living as lukewarm Christians? Are we living as a people who claim to relish in the fact that our God has loved us to the point of saving us? Are we living our lives with a higher moral standard than the rest of society? Are we being prophetic? When I use the word prophetic, I'm referring to both an evangelistic and missional motive because these are expressions of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
To be an evangelist, we merely have to share who God is with the world. This is primarily done through the spoken word on an individual basis, but it can also extend beyond that, as you may know. You could be speaking to a church on a Sunday morning like Anita did last week. You could be surrounded by a group of friends or a group of strangers and share your witness or your testimony. You could be speaking before children or youth. You get the picture, right? But then there's also this notion of being missional. And by missional, I'm, reflecting, I'm referring to the acts or the works or the services that reflect God in their very nature. The mere performance of any of these acts that further expresses or enhances the kingdom of God here on earth. It is important to know that being missional does not mean you have to go on a mission trip, though that is an example of being missional. Being missional can be so much more basic than that. You can serve at a soup kitchen. You can donate to a food bank. You can build ramps for folks in your community. You can be a positive influence on children, whether it's out and about at schools or in the ministries at your church. You can call seniors who are lonely and who can't get out because of the circumstances of this time. These are all ways of being missional. But let's just face it, these are just a few. This is not an exclusive list. In today's excerpt from Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, we find him trying to justify what he has done to them. He has, he has been trying to prove um, to the Christians of Thessalonica that he and his fellow apostles were sent from God and that they were there to spread or share truth, not fiction. It was not uncommon for philosophers of the day to come into these towns and speak of morality or prophecy. And in fact, what they were doing was trying to gain personal, have personal gain or monetary gain. So Paul and the other disciples had to be distinguished or separated from these untrustworthy influencers. And as Paul is trying to remind the Thessalonians why he is to be trusted, he reiterates some key aspects of his ministry leading up to his time in Thessalonica, primarily his suffering in Philippi. If we took a look at the book of Acts, chapter 16, we would find where Paul and Silas are actually imprisoned in Philippi. Who here remembers this story in Acts? One, two, two. It's a good thing we're talking about today. So, Acts 16, what happens is Paul and Silas are in Philippi. They had just recruited Timothy, and now they're going up and down the road. They're talking, and they're prophesying, and preaching, and teaching. And, what are they, and what's happened? This fortune teller, this Gentile fortune teller, has come up behind him and is telling the fortune as they go on. And he got so sick and tired of it, he turned around and cast out the spirit from her. And you can imagine how mad that family was when their, when their money-making daughter just lost her job because she no longer had that fortune-telling ability. And so what happened was they were upset, and the, Paul and Silas ended up being imprisoned and beaten because of it. Now, what's really important here is that Paul and Silas shouldn't have been beaten. They actually shouldn't have been beaten because they were Roman citizens, and you don't beat Roman citizens publicly, according to my sources that I was reading. So that was actually a problem. And then when they're released, if you look at how they are released and the words and, and everything, it actually tells you that Paul said, no, no, they're not just releases. You tell them to come down here and release us themselves. He, the, he wouldn't let the jailer just release them. Can you imagine the kind of like boldness? Hey, you can go from you can go from the jail. I don't know about you, but if I was put in jail, I'd be running out the door. But no, he's like, mm -mm. you get that magistrate down here and say, mm -mm. you tell me that I'm free to go. He was wanting to make a statement. Make a statement. Anyways, I digress. 
After the, their miraculous uh, release, like I said, read Acts 16 and you'll learn more about that. Paul, Timothy, and Silas traveled to Thessalonica, where Paul preached and professed his faith in Jesus in the synagogues. Now, this was custom of Jews at that time. You come into this new town or city, you go to the synagogues, you listen and you teach and preach, depending on who you were. And so when he did that, some Jews and Gentiles heard him and heard what he was saying as right, and then some rejected what Paul was saying. Some rejected it. And in turn, what happened? This is chapter 17 of Acts, friends. He was run out of Thessalonica. They were all run out of Thessalonica. A mob was created and they went after him. So they ended up leaving. There's more to that story, but that's why you got your Bible, right? Read chapter 17 of Acts. Well, that's where we come to here in the first Thessalonians. He's reminding the people that he and they, the other apostles, were mistreated, primarily in Philippi, but also they sucked, they were mistreated in Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Can you imagine how that probably felt? I can't. I can't imagine being rejected outright and and uh, a mob pushing me out the door and pushing me out of the, the city. That's almost like all y'all coming at me with pitchforks and, and uh, fire and trying to scare me away. I can't imagine that. But here Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica, particularly to the Gentiles. The Gentiles. In Acts, it puts a lot of focus on the Jews who converted, and then it talks about the Gentiles. In the, the actual letter to first. In 1 Thessalonians 2, Thessalonica, you have Paul talking primarily to the Gentiles. And we know this from particularly the first chapter of Thessalonians because he talks about their idol worship. They're worshiping other gods and how they turned away. And so here he is talking to them. And he's trying to remind them of what happened and he's trying to tell them who he is, who the apostles are, because he wants to make sure that it's clear to them that they know that he and the other apostles are not there to deceive, that they're not there to trick them. They're not there to do anything for their own personal gain. If he was wanting to do personal gain, he would try to hype himself up instead of put himself down. It was not common during the time to say, I was in prison and brag about it. Paul was boasting about being in prison because he was suffering like Christ suffered. That's what's so key here. When he talks about suffering and this mistreatment, he's oftentimes referring to how he is also going through something similar that Christ did. Christ suffered and died. And Paul, if you read his letters, especially the ones like when he's writing from prison and he doesn't know if he's going to live or not, you see him talking about the same thing. And here we can relate that because he is suffering like Christ because Christ was sharing the gospel. And then here he is sharing the gospel and he is suffering because of it. So his life is almost going in a similar direction as Christ's. And that's not to that's not confuse it and say he is Christ, but that's not true. But his life is experiencing suffering similar to that of Christ's. Now, why does this matter? And why did I name my sermon, Don't Be Afraid to Be Prophetic? And why did I say, the, uh, it, talk about evangelism and mission? Because these are ways to be prophetic, just like Paul was prophetic. <coughs> Paul prophesied, Paul taught, Paul evangelized in everywhere he went. A lot of times he was in prison because of the words he said, not because of the actual actions that he did. The words that he said were more powerful, and they got him put in prison. And missionally, he was, he, okay, so who here knows that Paul, that Paul worked with leather as a trade when he was a young man? Who here knew that? One. Paul did. 
Paul worked with leather as a young man, and that was a trade that he continued for the rest of his life to help make money so the churches that he started did not have to worry about financially supporting him solely. Yes, they sent him financial support, but most of the time the financial support gain was to go to other churches, not him. He tried to support himself. And why that's important is because in these places, he offered services to people. He offered opportunities for people to work. And it's also important to note that back then, a lot of times the artisans or the people who had these skills to do crafts or to, to build things or to do anything like that were mostly men. But then in a lot of these places where uh, garments are being made, because you know sandals are made out of leather back then, tents, clothes, certain clothing, a lot of different things like that, when the garments were being made, Women also worked side by side with the men, which empowered them to do more in a time where they were not truly empowered that much. So it's amazing to see these wonderful influences taking place. So there is his missional aspect. He's starting churches. He's working. He's providing services. He's encouraging people to do things for the communities to help other churches. He's doing all these great things from place to place to place. If you've not seen a map of his travelings, you should take a look. He was a busy, busy man. He went many places. I can't imagine traveling as far as he did. My feet hurt thinking about it. But here he was doing it. And everywhere he went, he preached the gospel. He spoke about his faith. He talked about who Jesus was. He was so strong and bold in his faith that he had to share it to everyone. In our scripture today, it's hot here. In our scripture today, it's a, there's a really cool part, and uh, it is on in. It is towards the beginning, and it says, We have the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. Now, I want to uh, be clear here. When I was doing my research for this, I went down some rabbit holes. Now, I don't know if any of y'all have ever went down a rabbit hole before, but it's kind of fun. And what I did here was I went and I looked up what the word for courage meant. And courage is actually the same as evangelize in a way. Because courage meant to boldly speak out, to boldly proclaim. So when he said courage, he's in essence meaning to evangelize. So I have a question for you. If being Prophetic means to be bold and, and, and in our speaking about who God is in each and every part of our life. If it means to be open to others and to speak freely, are we being that way? When's the last time that you openly talked about God when you knew it was going to be contentious? When's the last time you openly talked about God in public? Because the world we live in today doesn't like talking about religion. Or politics, does it? When's the last time you decided to talk about God in public? These are important times to be talking about God because we are losing sight. We are losing the, the path forward. We can't agree on politics. We can't agree on ideological standings. We can't agree in religion anymore. We have to be boldly proclaiming the gospel or we are doomed to forget gospel stands for. There's a reason why the Jews in the Old Testament kept saying over and over, especially if you read Deuteronomy, tell your kids this, don't let them forget, because when you forget, you are doomed to repeat the mistakes previously made. Don't we say that about history in this country? You learn history so you don't repeat it. Here's the thing, friend. Being prophetic means to boldly proclaim who Jesus is, no matter where you are, no matter what the consequences, no matter who's going to suffer because of it, no matter who is going to feel that pain from the persecution or the opposition. And it means to be missional. 
which means to reflect God in all that you do, not just your words, but your actions each and every day. Allow them to show who God is. It's a bold proclamation in and of itself because you are doing something that God encourages you to do, not something that the world tells you to do, but God tells you to do. It's about morality, friends. Do you have the moral courage to stand up and be a follower of Christ? Do you have the courage to be prophetic? Can you be like Paul and the other apostles and share what you truly believe anywhere you go in every way that you are? Or are you being cowardice? Are you sitting back and just biding your time? Are you letting others say what they're going to say that you believe is trickery? false or is deceptive or are you going to stand up and be a real Christian nobody said Christianity is easy Jesus said you're going to pick up the cross and follow me it's going to hurt and if you read the Bible it hurt all of them all of the early Christians all of the early apostles so I ask you friends are you afraid to be prophetic says being a Christian is the happiest thing they've ever done means that maybe they're doing something wrong. But yes, it provides joy to us. It provides fulfillment. But if you're not feeling the pains, the labors of what it means to be serving Jesus in this world, no matter your age, then you're doing something wrong. Because serving Jesus, being a Christian, is not easy. So as you leave this place, remember to be prophetic. Remember to serve the Lord always through your mission and your evangelism. Share the words of the gospel and live out that gospel each and every day. If you're reading your scriptures, you know what that looks like. Because Jesus did it first, now it's our turn to follow in his footsteps. Because he knows best. He is our Savior, our Christ. If we're not listening to him, who are we listening to? can't be any good. Go and be friends. Serve the Lord always. Always give thanks and glory to God. Be safe. Love you all. <laughs>